the last time we saw you, uh, you had just announced that you were also short on Duncan Brands. Uh, before we get into that, any other uh, positions that you care to share now? Any any companies, especially you know, with the markets on a comeback <laughs> lately, that you uh, places where you're taking a look and saying, nope, too much hype, overvalued. Well, I mean, one of the things we talked about today at the conference, which I thought was interesting, um, and we had the author of Bad Blood, John Kerry, from the Wall Street Journal, to talk about Theranos, is the culture in Silicon Valley, and this ties a little bit in with Tesla, um, and and why some of these things appear to be growing out in Silicon Valley, the willingness to sort of say anything uh, uh, by CEOs. There was, a, there was an expose on Vice Media this week in New York Magazine talking a little bit about the same thing. And, and the lack of due diligence on behalf of both the boards and the investors in believing a lot of these things. And is it increasing as the market goes on? And as I think you know, um, Jeff Sonnenfeld, who runs this conference, is also yeah. one of my bosses at, up at Yale when I teach a course on the history of financial fraud. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of, the, one of the central tenets of the course is that the fraud cycle follows the financial and business cycle with a lag. And that is as bull markets go on, people's sense of disbelief um, uh, is reduced and they, they begin to believe things that are too good to be true. It's human nature. And, and bad people take advantage of that. And I think we're going to see an increase in these kinds of revelation as time goes on, particularly out in Silicon Valley, I agree with, with John Kerry Roo on that, that there seems to be a culture where you're allowed to say things that in any other time uh, uh, people would say is illegal. You can't lie to investors. And so I, Jim, I are you saying this that, is the that, that there the are a lot, of, a lot of bad people in Silicon Valley and that there are some big frauds that are, are gonna come out of that for companies that otherwise we talk about positively day to day? I'm saying that the field is fertile for that, Wilfred, and that we're seeing instances of it, and I think we're going to see more of it. I'm not saying that everybody is like that, of course, um, and, but that investors need to do their due diligence. Investors need to hold you know, people in Silicon Valley at the same standards. They hold consumer products manufacturers and, and automobile manufacturers, home builders, whatever it might be. Um, you, you, can't, you can't not tell the truth, and, and that, at the end of the day, was the story at Theranos, and I think it's the story at, at some other companies as well. On Duncan specifically, Jim, uh, we had the CEO on responding to your shorting of the company, and he said, yes. maybe we can play the sound bite, yes. but he said, uh, listen, the, the stock has gone up <laughs> since, uh, since you announced your short yes, that, position. Well, it get, uh, what, what, yeah, go that ahead. Gets back to, that, gets ba that gets back to the previous conversation. It seems to me that, that both the prosecution and defense of bad behavior is the stock price. So if the stock price goes up, despite people <laughs> raising some real serious concerns, it's okay, right? The market has voted and therefore it's irrelevant. If the stock price goes down, or the company encounters financial difficulty, why then we need to, to have an investigation. And really the standard should be much higher than that. The standard should be, you can't lie to investors, I mean, we had a well-known investor, maybe the most well-known investor of the world, last week, talking about, about uh, in, his, in his quest to, to talk about not having to release guidance, saying he served on boards where the CEOs made up the numbers. And I thought that was the most newsworthy part of that interview, uh, was that here you have the most well-respected investor in the world saying he served on boards where CEOs made up the numbers. And I was sort of floored by that. And, and that, of course, was not the news from that interview. And, and I, yeah. I thought that, that if, if this well-regarded investor is saying that, then, you know, oh my gosh, uh, we really need people to, to be looking out for investors for when managements do this. And if, if someone Jim, like Warren Buffett won't do that, then we, we've got an issue. Jim, stepping away from uh, talks uh, of possible fraud, I want to ask you about the media landscape. And, uh, of course, AT&T Time Warner deal has been approved. There's now talk of all sorts of other potential uh, media consolidations. Does that now pose a big threat to the likes of, of Netflix, the new media companies? Uh, are they going to meet their match, as it were? It seems to me that Netflix is the one providing the difficulties for the other companies, which is why you have the mergers. And I think, uh, as, I, as I read the counts, and we're not involved there, but um, uh, the judge said basically the same thing, that 
that it's not just the media companies we have to look at for antitrust, we have to look at Silicon Valley as well because they in fact are the real competition and they're doing a pretty good job. So I, I think to me it seems just as an outside observer with uh, no skin in the game, if you will, that these are defensive mergers. Yeah, Jim, what about China? Uh, the, we know in the past you had talked about shorting Alibaba. I think covered that one a while ago. But what about the other names now that we continue to see high valuations? I was thinking even about the ZTE uh, instance, which is not what you're typically looking for, but a company that, you know, its poor behavior has led it to a near collapse from being, you know, hugely valued and, and, a, and a previously legitimate enterprise. Um, you know, are you looking at China, whether it's because of the trade issues or just because of uh, the culture there and seeing uh, fresh names to short? So China does not see the trade issues obviously the same way we do, but they also don't see them in the same economic Im importance as the current administration in the U.S. does. Um, China's much more focused right now on things like the One Belt, One, Belt, One Road initiative, um, which is a strategic initiative uh, as well as financial. And, and China's going to be more than happy setting aside the financial question uh, to, to take up any mantle that the U.S. is willing to, to sort of give up uh, in terms of leadership. They're more than happy to fill that void as a rising power. And so they, the, the aspects of trade with them are now taking second or tertiary viewpoint to the opportunity that the U.S. is giving China uh, not only in Asia but globally to uh, to become a respected power and I think that's one of the and, and I don't want to make this political conversation but um, they see the trade issue through that prism where we are seeing the trade issue simply through the the prism of of lost jobs and immediate tariffs and, and a bilateral kind of thing I think China's looking much further ahead and further well, let, down the so road on this let me ask than you this. we are. Um, any re any said, reason to short Alibaba again? <laughs> Just, I, mean, I mean, it's an extraordinary run. The Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, been, you know, the Xiaomi's about to list. Yeah, it's, it's, it, they have been incredible. You know that, that my view on Alibaba was an accounting view, and I still hold that view, by the way, even though we're not short the shares. Um, you know, the, the most amazing statistic about Alibaba, I keep pointing out to people, is that if you look at Alibaba's tangible equity uh, right now, less external share offerings, less any capital they've raised in the markets, their tangible equity is lower now than when they went public. So for all their profitability, they've taken back either affiliated companies or made further deals. Um, it, is, it is a financial perpetual motion machine. And it's quite, quite a marvel to behold. But because of, uh, because of my view that the SEC and others probably aren't going to be too worried about a Chinese company's accounting, even though it trades here, uh, we stepped aside, and I think it was the right move. Jim, were you surprised about the valuation that uh, Alipay got recently with its latest private round of funding, uh, a market capitalization, implied market capitalization uh, of over $100 billion, bigger than Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley? Right. Well, that, Wilfred, that's exactly to my point. We're, we're in this game now where all these companies who are affiliated with each other or investors who are affiliated with each other are swapping, I'll swap you my two fifty billion dollar cats for your hundred billion dollar dog. And then we do a markup on it. And and that's kind of what, what's so amazing in this story is that we're taking these gains on asset revaluations, which may or may not hold up, but they are not from cash flow from operations. Alipay is barely profitable from what we know. And so a barely profitable financial firm now has an implied valuation based on the last transaction of $150 billion. That's good work if you can get it in any country. Jim, before we go, Envision Healthcare was just taken out by KKR. Did that caused some pain around the office? <laughs> well, it wasn't taken out at a whopping 7% premium. Uh, this one puzzles <laughs> me, Kelly, because, I mean, if you look at this company, they're in the business of basically buying up doctor practices. And if you look at the cash flow statement, they had EBITDA of $900 million. They had capital spending and purchase of management contracts of over $900 million in the trailing 12 months. There is no free cash flow here, and uh, the buyers and the bankers are about to put $10 billion of debt on it. I, I'm, yeah. I'm just kind of puzzled as to why anybody in their right mind would think that that's a smart move. But, you know, they've spoken and I haven't. 
Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.